Hello, Internet. It's Daniel with Driving and Dragons. Today, I'm coming to you with a bit of a response video. I tried to do a reaction to Dragon Dreams, and StreamYard is just being obnoxious. Lots of glitches in the audio, gaps, just stuff that's too much of a pain in the butt to clean up. So I recorded the video, and it just didn't come out the way I wanted it to. So I'm still going to link his video below. So a short video about using homebrew versus pre-published campaign settings. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. On the 280ZX, we will finish up the power steering line and should be able to get to starting some of the work on the air intake here in this video. The actual work on the 280 as filmed is progressing very, very quickly. Clutch lines have been replaced bleeding them out today and hopefully I'll have that car back on the road very very soon and just needing a brake replacement and then it'll be mechanically sound. So Dragon Dreams he kicks off and he is discussing how he has been a homebrew game master for pretty much the whole time he's been playing and that he decided to start using the Mastara setting for some stuff and that he had noticed some benefits to using a pre-planned campaign setting. For him, he was talking about how it uh, doesn't use up so much of your creative bandwidth, saying you know, we've only got so much creative bandwidth. And as we go about creating and world building, we get to the point where we've used up our bandwidth to kind of put together the pieces that are there for the game. And if we use a pre-planned setting, we can use all of that creative bandwidth on the game itself, and a lot of the detail work has been taken care of for you. So you're not focusing so much on details of the world. You can focus more on details of the adventures, details of the puzzles, coming up with more creative things that the party will have to deal with and solve. And he likened it to focusing instead of on gross muscles on you know the small motor control muscles. Now, we'll say this. He got it a little backward because for me, when I look at it, and I'll look at it from a, well, let's look at it from a fitness standpoint here. That'll be fun. When you use a machine, the advantage of using a machine is that you can focus on just, it, it isolates the gross muscle. So for instance, when I sit down on a chest press machine and I start doing chest press, the only muscle that's really heavily activated is the pec muscle. And to a certain extent, like my triceps and a few other things, but mainly just your pectoral muscle is the only thing that's really activated. Because the machine is in a guided track and it only moves in one plane, it can't wobble, it can't move around. My body does not have to stabilize that weight. The benefit to that is I get heavy isolation on that muscle, strong growth on that muscle. The disadvantage is that I'm no longer using the fine support muscles and control muscles, those secondary muscles around my shoulder and around the lower pec and in the arms that keep the weight stable. And this is kind of where you get the difference between somebody who's cock strong or farm strong, whatever you want to call it, versus you know functional strength or just a hard man versus somebody who's like a gym rat, bodybuilder. Yeah, we've all seen that. We've all heard about that. you got some guy who's all construction worker, bricklayer, dock worker or something laughing at the guy who goes to the gym all the time and can't sit there and throw bales of hay or sling pallets of shingles or boxes or move stuff on the dock and can't, you know, just can't keep up. He's got that, you know, that farm boy strength. And a lot of that's because, you know, that farm boy's dealing with moving big, heavy objects and stuff that are in abnormal positions and abnormal uh, situations from uh, abnormal angles and that are odd shapes and are not balanced and he has to have all those other fine motor control muscles to control it. So what does that have to do with playing a tabletop role-playing game or game mastering one? Well, if you think of a homebrew setting, a homebrew setting is like going and doing free weight workout or doing a workout like doing that functional strength, real world exercise, strong man stuff where you're going out and you're hauling tires and slinging bricks and that sort of thing. 
because you have to do absolutely everything. You have to control every little bit. You have to pay attention to every little piece. And your players can cause catastrophic injury in your workout very easily because they start poking holes in your campaign setting. You're starting to put your story together, and they're asking you about the shopkeeper. They're asking you about this, you know, the na- the neighboring country, and you know, how do we feel about those people? Well, how do we feel about these people? What's the relationship between God A and God B? How do they interact with each other? Well, what about God B and God C? What about God C and God A? All these little details that are in the background of your world, they're asking you about, and it's very easy when you're going through trying to put everything together to miss that. Because one thing we don't have more of is time. Everybody has the same amount of time in the day. And crafting an extremely detailed world with answers to everything is basically a full-time job that most GMs don't have to put into their homebrew campaign. They need to put that heavy focus into working on their adventure to make sure that their adventure is playable, touches all the high notes, touches all the low points, gives all the challenges needed, is balanced, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then at the same time, you're building a world and building a campaign world. And that either takes a lot of practice, a lot of time, a lot of ta- natural talent and aptitude, or just a huge passion for the game, or a combination thereof to really pull off effectively. So... The advantage of that homebrew world is you get all this freedom. You get to create this truly unique thing that's yours and your parties. You get to have it tailor-made to how you want your game to run and the themes you want and the things that are happening. But what's the drawback is you have to plan four and five levels beyond where you think your players are going to go because you don't want them having a Wizard of Oz moment where Toto the dog pulls one curtain and they see the wizard behind the curtain. If you're going to do homebrew, you have to have 9, 10, 12 curtains. You've got to be able to go to where your players, unless they're just really being obnoxious, are not going to hit that invisible wall and find the edge of your world. So how does a pre-made campaign setting come into this? Pre-made campaign settings, your your middle ground. It's a lot like going to the gym and doing machine work or in cable work and that sort of thing. It's in a guided track. You don't have to worry about stabilizing things so you can focus on that core game master muscle, which is building an adventure, building a story, building something that is a fun, memorable experience for your party. And all those little details and little pieces are already taken care of for you. I think it's actually a very good thing for a game master to work in those pre-made campaign settings for a lot of reasons. One is it's going to help you find out where the holes are because your players are going to poke and you're going to find out where they poke and why they poke, whether it's about how these gods interact or how these nations work together, whatever the case may be. You're going to find that out, and you're going to have answers for it because they're in the campaign setting book, and that's going to be something you remember while you're playing your game. You also have the ability to focus on those core game master responsibilities of building that adventure and making sure things are balanced, because I can't tell you how many times I've seen a game master going, oh, I got this great home rule world, it's so awesome, this campaign's going to be so great. And the whole storyline adventure they have throughout their homebrew campaign is just a hodgepodge of, this is too hard, they blew through this, it was supposed to take six hours, it took 30 minutes, this took nine sessions, and it was supposed to be just kind of a a little dip, and this killed everybody, and how is everything so far off? And it ends up being because they've spent so much time trying to trace down all the details of their world that they neglected to really focus the time that was requisite to build a good adventure and to balance things out. By using that pre-made campaign world, they take a lot of that off of that Game Master's plate. Another good thing about your pre-made worlds is what I like to call plug-and-play. And I'm not talking about plug-and-play like, oh, I could just plug my characters into this campaign world and then play it, which you can. What I'm talking about is when you're doing homebrew, 
you can plug and play stuff from pre-published campaign settings to make life easier, both on you and on your players. In my current 3.5 D&D game, I have a complete homebrew world with a complete homebrew story and even, you know, homebrew monsters and all kinds of different stuff in there, special homebrew rules, the whole shebang. But I told my players, I'm like, hey, we're going to use the Greyhawk Pantheon. Well, why are we using the Greyhawk Pantheon? Now, we're not in Greyhawk, but we're using the Greyhawk Pantheon of Deities. Why? Because that saves me the trouble of having to create all these deities, tell you what they're gods of or goddesses of, flesh out their domains, and then have that player who wants to play a a cleric come forward and say, well, I'm really, you know, I want to have like a god of strength who has the strength domain and the heroic domain or the good domain. It's like what he wants to do is he wants to play chord, but I didn't make a chord. So now it's like, well, I either got to go make up another god or it's like, nope, you're restricted to these 10 gods that I made because I didn't have time to sit down and hash out 200 deities. And... I'm having to explain each one. Well, who is this God again? Who is that God again? What's he the God of? Oh, no, no, that's so-and-so's brother. He's the evil God. You know, oh, I didn't recognize that. When I could just say, no, we're using the Pantheon from Greyhawk, and we're using it for fun because that's a shorthand for me. Yeah, you're a cleric of Kord. It's like, no, Kord doesn't have the same character history and everything that he had in Greyhawk. But, you know, he's the god of strength and he's venerated by these people. So you can kind of pick little things out of it and either take the time to reskin it and just change the names to protect the guilty. Or you can say, hey, I've got a pretty good pantheon here. I can just make a few adjustments to create my gods. Or you can just straight up lift the stuff that's not important. Like for me, the actual deities in the pantheon play very little role in my world, so I really don't care that much about them because my people want to actually play the game and don't want to sit around forever while I dick around making a campaign setting. It's good to just shorthand that stuff in there because so I can focus on more important things. This is one of the many great uses of a pre-made campaign setting. It, you know, it shows you where the holes in your game are. It can help you with uh, with your own campaign settings by giving you things to kind of pull out of and plug them into your own setting and then be ready to go. And it can also provide you a situation where you can focus on those muscles of adventure building. Now, I'm going to take that one step further, and we'll just say that there's you, know, you got three levels. Level one is homebrew. It's top of the heap. You're responsible for absolutely everything. It's ultimate freedom. It's ultimate customization but it is the most labor-intensive and the most difficult to do properly. Then you have level two, pre-made campaign setting. You still have all the adventure and storyline control here. You still have all the corrections. You, You have the issues of you may run into that player who knows your campaign setting better than you. And when you bring up that such and such God did something, some, you know, so and so did this, they're going to say, well, no, so and so wouldn't do that. They're the good ruler of Silvery Haim. And Silvery Haim doesn't like Red Wizard because Red Wizard is bad and they, they've had a rivalry for hundreds of years. So why would they do that to each other? You have that kind of crap. So you have those restrictions, both of the established canon and history and established relationships and characters in the world, but you still have the freedom to create those your own adventures there and make your adjustments, and you have the ability to focus on just putting together the adventure and the story, and you can make the adjustments you need to make it fit because you have all that information available. Level three, which to me is the most basic, easy way to do it, is pre-made adventures. And I'm going to tell you one of the big things that Modules does. Modules is Game Master with training wheels. And I think every Game Master should run pre-made modules at least a little bit. Because pre-made modules teach you some very easy things. Your whole time, all your time investment as a Game Master is reading the module a few times, getting yourself familiar with it, knowing where things are supposed to go, and then making sure you run it effectively. 
But what it also teaches you is when I run a module for fifth level characters and I've got two or three first level encounters, two or three third level encounters, a couple of fifth level encounters, one or two seventh level encounters in it, I can see how those encounters are supposed to look. I can get guidance on how they're supposed to work and what makes them challenging. I can see how they play against the party. And when I go to make my own campaigns, even if I'm using a pre-made campaign world where I'm making my own adventures, I have a guidepost to make sure that I keep those encounters balanced and the challenge rating where they're supposed to. Because we've all done it. We've all sat down and played in a game with somebody that is just a disastrous train wreck of a bunch of stuff that's way too easy followed by stuff that's not possible because they've just blown up too much, gone so far overboard and made just enough wrong adjustments to the challenge of the adventure to make it where the players have virtually no chance. So homebrew versus custom commercial built role playing worlds. Both have their place. Both have their advantages and disadvantages. Game Masters should really use both. And Game Masters should also use pre-published adventures as tools and as guideposts while running their game. And I would even go so far to say this. If you're playing a game for the first time, like say you're going to pick up a new system, you should probably run at least a handful of pre-made adventures. Not just because you're new to the game and you're learning the system and it cuts down on your time and it helps with your learning curve. But as a game master, it helps you learn how those game designers were thinking when they were setting up their difficulty system and when they were setting up the way their encounters are supposed to work. And you can also kind of see those exploits coming when they come up. So what do you guys think below? You know, let me know in the comment section. Uh, check out the video from Dragon Dreams. I've would like this to have been a traditional response or reaction video, but StreamYard just wasn't working for me. And I just really am looking forward to hearing what you guys have to say about it. Like, share, and subscribe, and I will see you guys next time.